Hello, I'm Bob Challoner, the President and CEO of Southampton Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Focus on Southampton Hospital, your monthly program about the events, happenings, and programs at your community hospital. We have a very, uh, very interesting program for you today, probably one of the more high-tech programs we've seen in a while. And our, my guest today is a new vascular surgeon who joined our staff about a year or so ago, Dr. Rashmi Sharma, who comes to us very, very well trained, board certified vascular surgeon. And I'll talk a little bit about her, about what that means exactly. But welcome, Dr. Sharma, both to the show and also to, uh, to our community. I think, it's, I think it's about a year and a half at this point that you've been with us. Correct. So. Um, maybe you could just tell me a little bit about how, how did you end up out here in the uh, Hamptons? It's always an interesting uh, story to hear about people's journeys out here. So. Well, I grew up in the Bronx right. and uh, my parents live in uh, upstate New York. Oh, okay. Um, but I went to medical school in uh, North Dakota. Oh, wow. And I did my general surgery tra training at uh, University of California, Davis. Wow. Uh, then I went on to do an endovascular fellowship at Arizona Heart, and then my formal vascular fellowship at Atlanta Medical Center. Oh, wow. um, I went back to California where I had trained, because they recruited me, and spent about 10 years with Kaiser Permanente. Okay. And, um, Northern California or Northern, Southern? No, okay. Northern, Northern California. California. Okay. And, then I decided it was time to come home, wow. to come back to New York. To the East Coast to here. To the East Coast. Yeah. And uh, that time in the middle, you've been on both coasts plus in the middle, you've certainly traveled around the country. That's quite a journey. How long did all of that education take you? That sounds like quite a, quite a, quite a lot of education. It was a lot of education. Well, there's four years of medical school, right. my general surgery training. Um, I also did some bench research, okay. so that took seven years. Wow. And then my vascular fellowship took one year, and my endovascular fellowship took another year. That's fascinating. That's really, that's yeah. a, you certainly, um, certainly no slouch in the education department, and you come to us very, very well tra uh, trained. We're very happy to have you here. Let's talk a little bit about um, you're a surgeon who's pursued vascular surgery, and let's start off just generally about vascular surgery. What is a vascular surgeon? So a vascular surgeon is someone who deals with both arteries and veins right. and the diseases that occur in mm -hmm. them. Um, arteries take blood away from the heart, veins bring them back. So the two diseases that occur in arteries are blockage and ballooning of the arteries. Okay. So the blockage we refer to who as peripheral arterial disease. Okay. The ballooning we refer to as aneurysms. Right. In the veins, we have two problems. One is blood clot, we call that deep vein thrombosis. And the other problem is the valves in the veins don't work. So okay. that's when you get swelling and edema. So there's actually valves within the veins also? I've heard of valves in the heart, but I didn't realize that there were valves in the veins as yeah. well. Yes, there are, okay. there are. And that's to prevent the blood from flowing backwards, I guess, in the veins? Exactly, right. exactly, so that when you're standing erect, they're one-way valves, okay. and gravity wants to pull the blood down back in your legs. Okay. But, and, but if you have functioning valves, blood goes back up towards your heart. Right. If they're not functioning, when you stand, the blood comes down, and you have what's commonly referred to as varicose veins okay. and chronic venous insufficiency. Okay, so a lot of different illnesses and issues with the veins, which we'll, we'll get into in a little bit. Just remind me again, for the layperson, arteries take blood away from the heart and veins to the heart, right? Is that, is that exactly, right? Or, exactly. Yeah, okay. So the arteries are taking blood to the head, to the brain, okay. to the gut, and to the legs. Okay. And the veins are bringing all of that blood back to the heart. Okay. Um, the specialization moving beyond general surgery to specialization, I guess because the vascular system is just uh, so much more complicated, or why, why do surgeons actually need the extra specialization to, to, to operate on the, on, the, on the arteries and veins? Well, you know, vascular surgery has significantly changed in the past decade. Right. Um, about two decades ago, we didn't really have a formal vascular fellowship. Okay. The fellowship um, basically emerged due to advances in technology 
and wanting better outcomes for okay. patients. So that, number one, the technology was emerging where vascular surgeons are now endovascularly trained, okay. which you don't get in general surgery. Okay. And the second is that quality outcomes became important. And we right. come to realize that a vascular surgeon who does 100 carotids endarterectomies, let's say over a, you know, a two year period, right. will have better outcomes than a general surgeon who does, let's say, five carotid endarterectomies. Okay. So I think the field specialized for those two reasons. I see, so it's just, it's, it's, it's literally the practice makes perfect kind of philosophy. So. Exactly. And I've heard the term endovascularly trained and endovascular surgery. Talk about that a little bit. What is endovascular surgery? So endovascular surgery is where we are able to, let's say, open up arteries or repair aneurysms, right. which are ballooning of arteries, um, by means of catheters and wires and stents. Okay. Simply put, you know, two decades ago, vascular surgery consisted of making an incision right. and f actually fixing the artery, okay. which carried a higher, you know, which carries its own complications. Right. But now we're able to go into the artery through a puncture site okay. in the groin or in the arm. Right. And through that puncture site, we put a catheter, a tube, and through that tube, we can, we can fix aneurysms, we can open up blockages, and so endovascular basically means anything that we can do through a small catheter. So I think of it as, um, let's say I have, a, I have a pipe in my house and I get a plug in the pipe for some reason, something's blocking it. In the old days you would have had to open up the wall, cut into the pipe, clean it out. Now you're sort of snaking something through the pipe basically to, to pull out the whatever, the, to repair the issue. Exactly, to repair the issue so that we can go from the groin right. up to the artery in your neck okay. and open up the blockage and put a stent or put a balloon and um, we can actually go very far places. With just a little tiny puncture, puncture site, which site. I, I could see why that would be much, much, uh, much safer, frankly, and probably fewer complications. Um, and why are we able to do that now? Why weren't we able to do that years ago? What's happened with the technology that's allowing us to do that now? There, there have been significant advances in okay. technology, both in the arterial world and in the venous world. Right. Um, in the arterial world, we began to see that instead of open surgery, we can start to put balloons and stents. And right. so that came, you know, that came in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Right. After that, the arthrectomy um, advances in rotor rooter, okay. sucking out clot, sucking out plaque. The advances came and people started using them. Okay. And even before, um, be, before we knew it, we saw such good results right. because of such good patient outcomes um, that it just took off. Right. And, um, and, and patient demand as well, in right. that when it's presented to the patient, do you want an open operation right. where you'll be in the hospital for a week to 10 days and recovery might be several weeks right. and um, it will require general anesthesia and we're going to make an incision. Right. Whereas here's a procedure. You can have the procedure, you can go home the same day, there's same no day. recovery. Wow. It was patient right. driven yep. and outcomes driven. Right. Amazing. And so let's talk about a little bit of the technologies that you're using, um, which to me are just fascinating. I mean, the idea of essentially fixing a little vessel that some of them are fairly minute also and being able to, to see them and to get inside of them, work from the inside out. And you mentioned a couple technologies. One is the, the balloon and the purpose of a, how does the balloon work? What is the real purpose with the, with the balloon that you insert in the arteries? So usually, usually we don't use balloons by themselves. Okay. We usually we use them now in conjunction with if we've placed a stent okay. or if we've done arthrectomy, okay. i.e. a rotor rooter. Okay. So we're able to, um, we've bought that technology where 
were able to go in through the groin right. and put, put a wire through the artery and cross a blockage even below your knee in okay. the smallest of vessels. Really? And after we've crossed the wire, we can balloon. Okay. After we do the rotor rooter, i.e., suck out the plaque, okay. then balloon it, smooth out the artery, and take out the catheters and, and wires. The, so the balloon essentially is to open the the vessel back up, to yes. really to push push the walls out, I yes. guess, away from the blockage. Yeah. And then I know one of the things that happens is the insertion of a of a, a stent. Could you describe a stent for me? Sure. Sometimes when we balloon the artery and open it up, we used to find that the artery would quickly close back up. Okay. It would basically spasm down and close up. And that basically, if we just ballooned the artery, it wouldn't stay open for very long. Okay. And hence, and also, while ballooning the artery, you could tear the artery, which we call a dissection. Okay. So hence, they developed stents. Right. We found that stents if you dissected the artery, could keep the artery open, right. and that the patency rate, i.e. how long will the artery stay open, right. was much higher with stents in certain locations than it was with just balloon. Right. So the stent is basically made of different types of metals. It can be, it can be made of um, nickel, platinum, okay. different types of metals that you put in in different locations to keep the artery open. Okay. And it's something that goes in small and I just it sort of springs open or expands open as there, like there are two different right. types of okay. stents. One is that you balloon the stent to open. Okay. That's called a balloon expandable stent. Okay. Those stents are very strong. Right. Um, the other is a self expanding where you pull a string and the and it just springs open. I see. Um, those we put in arteries that are tortuous that you know, you don't want that are not a straight line, basically. Okay. And once the stent is in, does it stay in for the patient's life? Is that something I, I somebody asked me once, does the stent ever have to come out, I guess, is a silly question, but it's something lay people ask. So. Most of the time, you can't right. take the stents out. Okay. The stent becomes incorporated into the tissue and the okay. blood vessels. So yes, once you have a stent, it's going to stay it's there. Gonna stay. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk um, a little bit then about once one of the advances I know that's allowed this to happen is is imaging, and I guess part of the reason why you don't go from the outside in was just that's how you had to see it. Uh, what's changed in the imaging technology that's allowed you now to be able to to do this endovascular work? Well, I think the quality of the images, um, the uh, the quality of the images okay. has, has changed significantly. With the C-arm that we used to have a decade right. ago, we were not able to image the very small vessels in the foot. Right. Now with uh, the imaging that we have, we can even perform interventions on the vessel on the top of your foot. Really? So um, it's become important as increasingly as you know you have um, neurosurgeons let's say putting coils in very small blood vessels okay. in your brain for aneurysms so imaging is crucial right. for performing these procedures yeah, obviously knowing where to put the put the coils put the stents put yes. the balloons i can imagine that would be a challenge um, the diseases that you're treating endovascularly i know that there's several but the 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 one we hear the most about is peripheral artery disease, um, uh, or PAD, P-A-D, what, what is it exactly? What's causing it and, and what's actually going on when a patient has uh, peripheral artery disease? So peripheral ar arterial disease refers to a uh, buildup of plaque in the artery. Okay. And we have buildup of plaque starting at a young age. Okay. But Almost everybody sees a buildup of plaque? I know it's in different rates in different people. So. Exactly, right. different rates in different people. Okay. So the group of people that build plaque the quickest right. are the ones that smoke, okay. the ones that have high blood pressure, right. the ones that have high cholesterol, right. and the ones that have diabetes. Okay. So these are the four groups of people that we see primarily okay. with um, a buildup of plaque. So at the age of 50 or 60, the artery slowly has so much plaque that it can cause symptoms. Right. And there are varying degrees of symptoms that it can cause. Okay. And 
Can you just, what is plaque exactly? We all talk about it, but what, what exactly is plaque? Is it, is it just fatty buildup or is it, a, and why is it so hard to get rid of get, it? Why can't you just flush it out of the system? Um, well, it's difficult to flush yeah. it out. So we call it arthrosclerotic disease. Mm -hmm. It's made of calcium, cholesterol, um, blood products okay. and it's very it becomes very hard okay and so it's not that e easy to cross when you're totally when it's totally blocked okay all right and I've seen pictures of um, cross sections of you know vessels that have plaque buildup it almost looks like when you've seen an old pipe in an old building and the inside of it suddenly is full of all this calcification it almost looks similar to that so and clearly then when the um, buildup happens, the blockage occurs, what happens then? So it's a progressive disease. Okay. Um, it starts out initially, let's say if you have, it's, it's progressive. So initially what you have, if we're talking about peripheral arterial disease in your legs, right. initially you will have claudication. Okay. Um, Cla claudication. Cla claudication. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Right. No, that's okay. You're doing um, actually a very good job for the lay people among us. So. <laughs> Yeah. So it starts off initially with um, pain right. in your buttocks or your thighs or okay. your calves okay. when you start walking or when you are in, engaged in activity that requires more blood flow Okay. because you have a certain amount of blockage right. and when you engage in exercise it requires more blood okay. and because you have the blockage you can't get the extra blood okay. so then you have pain. Shoot, sharp shooting pain, dull pain, what is it typically? It's basically muscle pain. Okay. Muscle pain that becomes, that starts off, um, you know, not that, not that bothersome to the right. point where you can't walk anymore right. because there's too much pain. Right. If you stop, the pain goes away right. because the muscle is not requiring that much blood flow anymore. I see. Once you start walking again, the muscle requires the blood flow, the pain comes back. Okay. So those are the typical symptoms okay. of claudication, and that's how PAD initially presents. Okay. No physical manif I mean, physical manifestation, or can you see a change at all, or could the average patient see a change happening? They could. Yeah. You will notice that you'll have hair loss. Okay. You'll notice that perhaps one leg is colder than the other leg. Right. Um, so there's some physical manifestations in the early days. Okay. Okay. And the process that takes, is there any length of time typically or can vary? It can vary. Right. So, you know, if, if you have claudication, and if you have those risk factors that we discussed, right. the smoking, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, if you control those risk factors and you stop smoking and you start walking right. and you control your diabetes and you control your blood pressure, then the claudication will remain stable. It will. It will. The blockage okay. will remain stable if you, if you modify your lifestyle. Okay. For those people, about 15% that don't the 30 percent that don't modify their lifestyle, right. um, it becomes progressive. I see. Will it go away if somebody really changed their lifestyle? Is there a chance that, or is it typically it just stabilizes? You know, we have not invented a, a drug to right. make the plaque go away yet. Okay. And if we do, then it'll put me out of business. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the um, issue on um, pain. Uh, early sign, warning sign, um, when should somebody really think that I should go see a doctor at some point or go see a vascular surgeon to have this checked out? I think that, um, I think that when you have claudication, right. that's, a real, that's a real symptom okay. that should prompt you to see a vascular surgeon. Okay. Um, claudication, if not addressed, does progress to rest pain. Right. And rest pain, if not addressed, does progress, you know, to gangrene or ulcers. Okay. So like I said, in patients whose risk factors are not controlled, it does become a progressive disease. It does, okay. And is the blockage something that's happening all along the vein or it's in spots or what's what's happening? In, in, the, ar in the arteries. Or in the artery. I mean, so yeah. 
there are typical locations for where blockages usually okay. occur. So it's happening in locations where anatomically uh, blockages occur okay. for reasons of hemodynamics. Okay. And we know typically where they are. They are either, you know, in the arteries uh, above your groins, which we call the iliacs, okay. or they're typically in the arteries right above your knee, which okay. we call the SFA popliteal junction. Okay. Um, in diabetics, it's mostly below the knee. Below the knee, okay. And you said if it's not treated um, and lifestyle changes don't happen, it just it progresses and uh, gangrene sounds pretty bad. That's, what is, what's happening exactly? The, the flesh is being starved of blood supply or? Exactly. Okay. So. Um, it typically, you know, you, breast pain or gangrene or ulcers. These are the three things that really concern vascular surgeons. Okay. Um, because it's telling us that you don't have enough blood, that the blockage has progressed to the point that you don't have enough blood flow for the tissues okay. to survive. Okay. Uh, or for the ulcers to heal. Right. Um, that usually is associated with blockages in several locations in your leg, not just one location. Okay. And it, that those thing, those three things, really we call critical limb ischemia. Okay. And we need to address that right, right. away. Then you really are in danger of losing losing your limb. Does it ever happen in other parts of the body other than the legs? Can it happen in the arms or upper? You know, it can happen in the arms. Right. Um, there's a thing called Berger's disease. Okay. It's, it's a disease that occurs in young, young people who smoke quite a bit. Okay. The arteries go into vasospasms and they become blocked and they start losing digits. Okay. And toes. Okay. Uh, and there are other um, inflammatory de diseases that cause specific blockages in the arms. So it can occur. Okay. But the majority that we see are in the legs. In the legs. And how do you typically, like, do you do something to, to how would you diagnose it? What's a what would be a test that, um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming there's a way to check to see if a blockage is happening before you actually have to go inside and look? There is. You okay. know, people talk about screening ultrasounds, okay. which isn't something that I'm in favor of. Okay. But there are several tests. One is a test called PVR-ABI, okay. which is a test that takes less than half an hour, right. where you put blood pressure cuffs on different segments of the leg, right. and you measure the blood pressure, right. and you look at the waveform of the artery. Okay. And it will tell you, you know, the percent of blood flow that you're getting because you compare that blood pressure to your arm blood pressure. I see. We call that ABI. Okay. So that's one test. The other test is just the dedicated duplex ultrasound. Right. You take an ultrasound, you look at the arteries, starting from the iliac all the way down. Okay. And you measure the, you know, measure the velocity of the blood flow, and you look at the artery and you see the percent a blockage in the artery. Okay, and then based on that you can tell this is something we need to go in and operate or, or whatever. Right, based right. on that and you know of course a full physical exam of the patient and in association with their symptoms would then prompt you know a vascular surgeon to intervene. We don't intervene in everyone. Right. I mean, if a patient comes with claudication symptoms and we see they have blockage, right. we would first recommend you know lifestyle modification right. and changes. Right, just get up and keep start moving, and that really does help to actually get up and start moving. To start exercising, really? yes, it does. Okay, um, we've introduced some new technology here at Southampton Hospital, our hybrid operating room, and. Uh, can you just briefly, we keep talking about a hybrid operating room. What's so different about a hybrid operating room and, and why does it help you, a, a vascular surgeon? Well, the hybrid operating room provides two things. Okay. One, it provides the superb imaging that we need right. to do our end, endovascular procedures. Okay. That imaging previously was just available in the interventional radiology suite. Okay. So we have that imaging. Two. We call it hybrid because it's in the operating room. Okay. So we have the best imaging in a clean environment. I see. So in the operating room where we would do our open surgical procedures and make incisions and it's a sterile environment. So now we have a sterile environment with the best imaging. So it allows us to do hybrid 
hybrid, which we refer to as both endovascular and open surgery. Okay together I in see. the same setting. So you're able to combine the imaging and the actual surgical procedure at the same time, which I would guess would be a big improvement because you can actually see the placement where you need to go right right on the spot. Right. So. And you've done several amazing procedures here at the hospital already. I know on the first day of our opening the, the center you actually um, did a limb saving procedure and you also did an aneurysm repair and could we just talk about both of those for a second the the limb saving procedure what did what did you actually do well the limb saving procedure was in a patient that had two main problems okay. she had disease and occlusion of blood vessels below her knee okay and she had formed clot in the artery above her knee. Oh, okay. We didn't know what we were dealing with when we started, but right. that's what she had. Right. So we were able to, through a puncture and, and the artery, go over right. and actually suction out the clot that was above her knee right. with, with our AngioJet machine. Okay. After suctioning it out, we would then shot a picture and saw that she had significant occlusion of an artery of, of one artery. The other two arteries cl were closed. We right. actually have three arteries below the knee. Two were closed. Okay. One open. When one was open, but it had a significant blockage. Okay. So we were able to go and do a rotor rooter and such and get the plaque out okay. and then balloon the artery. Okay. Can you typically rotor rooter? That's a uh, old plaque, or it sounds like uh, uh, is uh, is rotor rootering the new the new way that things are done? So. Seems yeah. to make sense. I mean, it works in my plumbing. Why not in my leg, right? <laughs> so, it depends right. on the age yeah. of the okay. plaque. So if, if sometimes when you have severe blockage, right. let's say it's 80% blockage, okay. and then there's a blood flow slows down, right. so then the artery closes off. So the 20% is fresh clot. Okay. 80% is old, you know, plaque. Right. In those situations, we have another machine that the angiojet machine, which will go in and suction the clot out, mm -hmm. and now it's 80%, so then we can go in rotor ruler and take the plaque out, okay. and then we balloon the artery to smooth it out. Okay. It's a little... For it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's a lot more complicated, I'm sure, than, than the description you're providing. It's, got, it's an amazing thing. And so this patient's leg, what happened to her? She was able to... She, she did great. Yeah. Um, she, uh, the next day she was up, she was walking around. Right. And um, the only reason she didn't go home is because her daughter couldn't come pick her up from Montauk. Oh, really? So she went home the next day and she's done well. We followed her. That's an Closely. amazing story. And had she not had that surgery, she might have lost her, might have lost her leg. So. Yes. Okay. Yes, and so and she was 88 years old. Wow. So, um, you know, there's some patients that, if we put them through ma a major vascular bypass open surgery, right. they they take months to recover, and sometimes they never do. And the other work I know you've been doing is um, aneurysm repairs and. Uh, aneurysms you described as a ballooning and eventually I guess like a balloon if it keeps ballooning it'll pop which sounds pretty pretty major actually so what do, what do you do in that case so in that case you know the hybrid room right. was very beneficial because in him we wanted to make two small groin incisions right. so we want to make that in an open in a sterile environment which the OR provided for us. Okay. Yet we needed good imaging to, you know, accurately place the stent right below the kidney arteries okay. where the aneurysm started. And um, so we made two small groin incisions and we put the stent through each of the arteries in the groin right. up, up into the aorta right below the kidneys and placed, opened up the stent and we shot our pictures and it was in very good position. Wow. So now the blood that was flowing in the aneurysm, which is now a thin wall of the artery, mm -hmm. is now flowing through the graft. Okay. And so you don't have that pressure against the thin wall artery continuously, wow. which may eventually cause rupture. I see, so you literally put a patch in from the inside out. Inside it's out. Unbelievable, just amazing. And we're almost out of time, but there are a couple quick things I wanted to mention that, number one, um, 
will show a picture of the hybrid room and you're doing work in our wound center, some amazing work that people who have uh, peripheral arterial disease are, end up with wounds. I know you're also doing work on a, uh, um, for people who are suffering from um, uh, uh, veins um, in their legs and things and that you can address a lot of those issues as well. And, and, and how is that done? That's not necessarily done the hybrid room, but you're able to do that in your practice also for, um, um, I'm blocking on the, on the term right now, the um, uh, varicose veins, varicose veins, that you have a program called Happy Legs actually to, you know, some things that a lot of people as we get older and they are pretty unsightly, you're able to deal with those as well, so. Yes, we yeah. do, we do the vein procedures um, in our office. Okay. Um, and we, we have an ultrasound, we, you know, we make the diagnosis of venous insufficiency okay. with the valves not working and then we go ahead and do the procedures. Um, but with the veins, you know, you can have valves not working, venous insufficiency, right. or you can have clot in the veins, which we call deep vein thrombosis. Right. And we have been able to, in our new endovascular suite, offer patients who have clot, acute clot, right. within two to three weeks, okay. we've been able to go in and suction the clot out wow. of the vein. These are the deep veins right. now. Right, right. Okay, it's amazing. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, there's so many more things I'd like to talk to you about, but I, um, I certainly want to thank you, Dr. Sharma, for the great work you've done. I know you've really, you know, changed some people's lives already and saved some people's lives here with the work that you're doing and the new technology that you're using. And I'd like to thank our donors, certainly Audrey and Martin Gruss, for making this possible, the new hybrid room. Um, Dr. Uh, Sharma sees patients at her office at Hamptons Vein and Vascular at 325 Meeting House Lane, Building I, Suite uh, A, Building 1, Suite A. Um, and if any of you have questions for her or would like to learn about more about what she's doing, you can call her office for an appointment at 631-283-3583. And I'm, I feel like we're very lucky to have you here in the community, Dr. Sharma. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you for watching, um, for your comments and suggestions for shows. If any of you would like help, as always, uh, navigating our healthcare system here on the East End, please feel free to call my office at 631-726-8555. Um, I'd like to thank our friends at CTV for producing this show, our friends in, in airing it in Southampton, and our friends in uh, LTV in East Hampton communities for airing the show for our East Hampton communities. Thank you all for watching. Good health, everyone, and we'll see you soon.